So with all of that said, I'm very glad that you all are here with me today for this workshop uh, on God's pronouns, an interdisciplinary discussion on the role of gender in research on religion and theology. Uh, my first book that came out in 2020 is an accessible walk for um, Christians to go through the process of saying, how do we wrestle with the texts that have been used against LGBTQ people, and also some of this work of how do we question the images of God that we hold in order to break open a more expansive understanding uh, of this supreme being or this deity that we have a relationship with. So that's a bit about my background, and now I'm looking forward to our time together today. So just a brief outline, uh, we've already introduced the topic and we are going to, I'm going to start with just a couple experiments, a couple studies to say why does this even matter? Why should we talk about gender in theology or research on religion, especially why should we do it here in Austria? Why is it necessary? Why does it matter? And so we'll do that through two experiments. Then I'll just provide a very brief overview of the essay that hopefully you read from Elizabeth Johnson, uh, but if not, then you can pull from this very brief overview. And then most of our time, I'm looking forward to uh, focusing on the discussion together here in the circle. So we'll probably, my hope is to have about 40 minutes uh, that are just discussion. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts uh, and not silence. Thank you in advance for your thoughts. So let's get going with our first experiment. How many of you are still on Facebook? I know that it's kind of a dying app. I'm still on Facebook. I still scroll way too many hours in a day. Uh, and I was excited when I was scrolling through Facebook to see a post by the University of Vienna. And I realize that's far away, so I'll read it to you. Uh, this post is from the university, and it says we have a new diversity competence certificate. A certificate offered by the university for diversity competence. And I thought, well, wow, that's pretty great. You know, the university is really trying to embrace diversity and make sure that in a European country, a particularly white European country, and I name myself as a white US person, that we value diversity, wonderful. So then I thought, well, let me see what the people who are interacting with this post, most of whom uh, either live or are from Austria, what do they think about this post? So then I clicked on the little like or laugh react bottom uh, button at the bottom where you can see who responded to this post and how they responded. And before I share the rest of the data, I just want to say that these are all public, uh, this is a public Facebook page and that the data, the names and pictures you see are things that folks have publicly consented to share through their terms and conditions with Facebook. So, I'm gonna post a few things here, and I just want you to tell me what do all of these people have in common? So I clicked the laugh react, and I said, who are the people that are laughing at this post most? Who's laughing at a post about diversity? What do they seem to have in common? I realize it's far away. Lots of men. Lots of men, yes, yes. And particularly lots of white men. So when we look at the laugh reacts, there are 27 laugh reactions to this post. And on May 10th, there were 110 total reactions. So out of 110 total reactions, 27 were laughs. And of the 27 users on Facebook who laughed uh, at this, 22 of the 27 are self-identified men on their Facebook profiles. 22 of the 27 people who laughed at a post about diversity are men. Four are from women and one is unspecified. Now continuing on, who liked the post? There are 81 likes on this post as of May 10th. What do you notice, same question, about most of these people? What do they seem to have in common? A lot of women. A lot of women. Out of the 81 uh, who liked this, it's overwhelmingly female. 59 of the 81 self-identify on Facebook as female, while only 18 of those who liked the post identify as male, and four are unspecified. So we could say that clearly there's some connection between a respect for diversity and gender. 
specifically that there would appear to be a correlation between femininity and an embrace of diversity, which gets us into our topic today. So of course I had to comment, uh, as, as one does sometimes, so I commented uh, sarcastically and said it's really important to me to see that the university is offering a course on diversity, especially since there are so many white men who laughed at this. And so, of course, uh, someone, uh, a man from Austria, commented that I am spreading American propaganda uh, and that, quote, in his view, uh, there are, let's see, quote, we are in Austria. The majority of the population also rejects gender and diversity ideology. We are in Austria, he says. Clearly, there's some connection here. I know we don't have a large enough sample size to say all of Austria to draw broad conclusions, but from this experiment, we can see that there's some relationship between masculinity and specifically this social hegemony, this dominance of one group, one social group, specifically men and a specific type of man, mostly a heterosexual man over all others. And um, black theologians like Calvin Warren or philosophers like Calvin Warren would say that the ontological structures on which humanism is founded uh, negates or precludes black people from even being considered people. Uh, so in this case, we'd say that even black men aren't considered proper men according to this white masculine hegemony of heterosexuality. So there's some relationship here between gender and diversity. And so all of this is to say that gender matters. It plays a role in shaping how we perceive difference. Gender plays a role in how we perceive difference and how we understand our own place in the societies in which we live. Gender affects how we respond to diversity, as this post shows, diversity among people, and also, as we will see with Elizabeth Johnson, how we respond to diversity among the names and symbols and pronouns that we use when referring to the, div to the divine. So gender plays a role in our embrace of diversity. And that's our first discussion question, which we'll discuss after this brief presentation, is how does our theology and our research on religion, each of us, how does the work that each of us does affect and reflect the role of gender in our own work and in the communities that we hope it will impact, or in the scholastic communities who are engaging with our work? How does our work reflect and affect the role of gender in um, scholasticism. Now, briefly, question uh, experiment two, just to add in some art here, to say that we use language and also our concepts are um, perceived through art and symbols. So in this picture, which you probably know from Michelangelo, uh, I want you to think about how is the hegemonic social location, the dominance of the artist and his patrons as wealthy Italian men reflected in this image of the divine? How does this one image of God reflect the social location of the artist and his patrons? And what does this image convey about masculinity? What does this image convey about masculinity? And what does it convey by omission about femininity? Now, with this next image, uh, I want just your initial thoughts. Whatever you're thinking right away, I want you to say it, because it's going to be quite a stark contrast. What comes to mind? What do you feel? Lovely. You love it. Yeah. Why? What does it make you feel? Empowering scene. Empowering scene. So this is created by uh, Harmonia Rosales who you can find on social media or on her website to support her artwork. She's an Afro-Cuban American whose work has focused on black female empowerment. So it's very important and affirming to hear folks say that they felt seen and empowered through this image. Uh, who focuses on the empowerment in Western culture, depicting um, and honoring the African diaspora. And so what I want you to think about is how is the social location of this artist and the community that she's seeking to reflect and to serve reflected in this image. 
even in our group, in our discussion, some people already express that this image is more empowering for them. What do you feel when you see this image? How does it disrupt hegemonic masculinity, whiteness, and let's be honest, American, uh, white, US, European centrism sometimes, and heterosexuality? How does this image challenge that in the way we think about God? How might this image of a black female God, which is equally as valid as the first, change the way in which we write about God in our own research. If we're not only confronted with one image of who God is, but if we have this image in mind as we're writing, how would that change the very way in which we do theology, the very ways in which we write about our topics and the communities that we're studying? And this leads us to our next set of discussion questions, which we will have time for uh, after this presentation. Why do our images and pronouns for God matter? What effect do they have on those who interact with them? How are we being complicit in the images that we use in our research or the artworks that we choose to study and give importance to? How are we being complicit in the perpetuation of harmful patriarchal concepts of God that have real consequences in the world? And how might we each move from complicity to a critical engagement, which each of us is already doing in our research, how might we move into this place of critical engagement with the gender of God and subversion in the ways in which we articulate our thoughts about God theologically? Again, these are questions that are on your handout for us to discuss later. But this idea that there are more than one valid images of God uh, leads us into our text for today. The Female Symbols for God, Apophatic Tradition and Social Justice by a Catholic theologian, uh, Elizabeth Johnson. And just to go off what uh, has been said in this group already, in some ways it seemed like uh, a total opposite image. But in some ways it, it shows us, I think, that there's more than one valid one, that both can be used and that, in fact, and we'll see in Johnson, that multiple images of God are necessary for theology to live up to its calling, uh, its apophatic calling, which we'll get into. So just to reiterate Butler's theme uh, in this essay, her thesis, uh, not Butler, sorry, Elizabeth Johnson, <laughs> switching gender studies hats here. Uh, Elizabeth Johnson says that her uh, thesis is that this essay argues that using female symbols for God, not exclusively, so not just using that one image or just saying she when referring to God, but in combination with male, animal, and cosmic images of God, using female symbols in combination with other genders and other symbols of God is both legitimate and necessary for the healthy life of the church. And she goes through this, and I have to say, as someone who studies Tillich, uh, that her uh, use of symbols here is strikingly similar. So Johnson goes through the key concepts uh, here, and she says that, there's a relationship, a formative relationship, between symbols and the communities that engage with these symbols. She notes, quote, the image of God shapes a community's corporate identity. The image of God shapes how a community understands itself and their behavior, as well as the individual behavior of the community's members. The symbol of God shapes the community and the behaviors of the individuals. All this is to assert Johnson's most famous quote, which is, quote, the symbol of God functions. The symbol of God functions, she says, beyond verbal or visual references, it focuses a whole complex of conscious and unconscious ideas and feelings, emotions and associations, very deep and tenacious. It is never neutral. The symbol of God is never neutral in its effects, but it expresses and molds a community's bedrock convictions and actions. The symbol and images of God that we use express and mold the way we act together and individually as part of this community. Then Johnson goes on to say uh, that women's scholarship on this subject has made it piercingly clear that naming God almost exclusively in the image of a powerful ruling man 
has at least three pernicious effects. One, she says, by using only masculine images and pronouns, we, it has this literalizing effect. It reduces God from something beyond comprehension to an idol, an idol of a wealthy man, as we saw in the first image. Two, the use of exclusive images for God legitimates the structures of male authority in both civil and ecclesial communities. Right, we say, in the name of God the Father, who rules over all men, and therefore men have a duty to command and to lead and control on earth as it is in heaven. That's a second pernicious effect. The third, she says, is that it robs women of their dignity by distancing them, by distancing their human nature made in the image and likeness of God from their own concrete bodily identity. If God is always pictured as this buff heterosexual male, then how can women be affirmed in their own physical bodies, she says. Now what we see here with these three concepts uh, about the apophatic tradition and the three ways in which only masculine images for God, the ways in which our use of only masculine images um, transgresses these three rules of apophaticism, I think is really brilliant. What we see here is that Johnson brilliantly places side by side the harmful effects of only using masculine language and symbols for God, and these three rules for speaking about God within the apophatic tradition. And this juxtaposition itself shows just how deleterious the effects of exclusively masculine language are not just for women or for persons who fall outside of the heteronormative model of masculinity, but equally so for theology itself as an apophatic tradition, for theology and the communities of faith. Exclusively masculine language harms women and undermines the very work of theology. It undermines the work of theology by reducing God to an idol, by providing no other expression for God than this one image we have, and by reducing us from what she quotes from Aquinas, the necessity of giving God many names. And on the back of your handout, you'll see other names for God that Johnson lists uh, from other traditions uh, as well as from Christianity. And I encourage you to think of other names that you have that might be counter to this. So I'm saying all this just to say that it's not just woke or politically correct uh, to use other images for God, but that it's essential to the very theology that we hope to do and to our research, that we engage with symbols and pronouns for God uh, that reflect more than just the masculine identity. Diversity is necessary for theology and the health of our communities, and specifically in this case, a diversity of images and pronouns for God is necessary for our theology and for our communities. So as we come to a close, just to review Johnson's method, she examines the effects of using exclusively masculine symbols, and then she uses the apophatic tradition to challenge this exclusive use. Very clear and concise, which I appreciate. And you can see all of these different alternative phrases to use for the for God from uh, different traditions as well as the Christian tradition. And it's amazing to see how natural some of these feel, uh, at least for me, to think of God as holy mystery. Well, of course that's not gendered. Unless, even as I say that, sometimes I have a masculine image pop into my mind, and then I have to challenge that. Well, why, when I'm using a genderless concept, do I feel a very masculine sense of what I'm communing with? And so I have to go back and deconstruct my own faith uh, in that process. So there are other names that you can pull from, uh, from this sheet, and I'd love to hear other thoughts from your own traditions and contexts that you've used that are alternative phrases. And also phrases from uh, cosmic reality, right? God is described in the Bible as pillar of fire, light, cloud, uh, darkness. God is described as creative ground, as hovering mother hen or angry mother bear. So other words and symbols that we can use. And our final discussion questions are how does our theology and our research on religion, this is just to reiterate the first questions, how do they reflect and affect the role of gender in our work and our communities? And how do our images and pronouns, why do our images and pronouns for God matter? Why should we avoid using exclusively masculine language uh, when talking about God 
in our writing, which I know is sometimes necessary in German to use a pronoun. So how can we counter that in our own languages? So, vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. And now we move into 20 minutes or so, 30 minutes of discussion.